We are going to be talking about the biggest driver of change within business today. There are no prizes for guessing what that is. Of course, that biggest driver of change is technology. But we're going to be talking about a different attitude from the world's leading businesses. Those leading businesses are fully embracing technology to develop a digital-first mentality. And by doing that, they are opening up game-changing benefits and transformative change. What are the ways in which you can upgrade a caterpillar? There are different ways. Some people, the nature fans among us, would say that we can take this brown, boring caterpillar that crawls along the ground and we can turn it into a gorgeous butterfly that can soar to the highest heights of the rainforest. So this is a great transformation, but this isn't the only way we can think of to upgrade a caterpillar. Another suggestion might be to let this caterpillar do a little bit more through technology. We might decide to give our caterpillar roller skates. But don't let the cool appearance of this caterpillar fool you. This is all style over substance. These two levels of change, these two transformations are not born equal. One is drastically better than the other. And this is what businesses today are being faced with. They can embrace technology for small benefits or they can use it to transform themselves. A couple of examples for you. We can think about how we used to buy books. Of course, we used to go to bookstores, but then we got the internet and we could use newfangled innovations like Amazon.com to buy books in much the same way, just faster and cheaper through the internet. But in the long term, technology is totally transforming our relationship between books, with books and media. There were a group of people who read the Twilight books and watched the films and decided they loved it. And so then they went on to a variety of online community groups to talk about their favorite parts of the film and to write their own fan fiction around this. And different people commented back on this fan fiction and through this dialogue, it got better and better and better to the point where the world was given the masterpiece that we all know and love as Fifty Shades of Grey. So it's amazing that some of the most innovative technology still gives us variations of tacky smut. But hopefully you can see how people are interacting with technology differently or interacting with media differently through this. Another example is when we feel sick. We used to go to the doctor, but now, of course, Google is our doctor. We can type in our symptoms and find out all the ways in which we are going to die horribly next week. But that's, again, just faster, a faster and cheaper version of what we had before. In the long run, technology is opening up an entirely new way of us interacting with our health. We can now take a swab of our mouths, post that off, and not just learn how we're going to die horribly next week, but how we're going to die horribly 40 years from now as well. But of course, other technology may come to our rescue. We may find that DNA editing can develop a bit further and we can actually tackle these issues before they really affect us. The third example is restaurant reviews. Restaurant reviews were in the newspaper and then they became digitized. So in the simple tap on a smartphone screen, we can find out how various people wildly overacted to being mildly disappointed in a restaurant, but there's nothing new about that. In the long term, though, other businesses have embraced technology, businesses like Deliveroo and Uber Eats that enable businesses to, or enable restaurants to widen their customer base and start to behave like food delivery companies. 
But those businesses are thinking even further. They are starting to act like real estate companies, where they are offering these businesses what we call dark restaurants. These aren't restaurants where the lights are out. These are spaces that customers can't visit. Chefs make meals in these spaces for delivery only. And these businesses are now getting so sophisticated that they understand that they have access to data and insights that no one else has. So they're starting to sell those insights to restaurants to help them work out where they should open up their next few branches to de-risk the rollout. So this is a very different change to the, the short term with technology. If we map this out, in the short term, through technology, we're essentially seeing linear change. We're able to do much the same things that we were before, just cheaper and faster. In the long term, though, when we fully embrace technology and this, these new business models, we get an exponential level of change. Another way of looking at this is to say that in the short term, we're essentially taking traditional business models and adding some technology to that. But in this new exponential future, the businesses unlocking this real value are thinking entirely digital first. Now, I want to ask you, does anyone know how a caterpillar turns into a butterfly? You would think that a caterpillar decides to turn itself into the butterfly by stepping into its cocoon. And then hopefully you can see the cocoon here. I'm not just a woman awkwardly standing on a stage and apologies to the people behind here. Um, it steps into its cocoon and I thought that it retracted its legs into its body and it grew wings out of its back. But that's not what happens at all. Instead, the caterpillar gets into its cocoon and then it breaks itself down into DNA soup. <laughs> so that means that its nose falls off, breaks into soup, and bits of nose become bits of foot. Bits of elbow become bits of wing. And after melting itself down, completely rebuilding itself, it then steps out as a butterfly. My mind was blown when I found this out. But you also have to ask yourself, how is the caterpillar feeling when it steps into its cocoon? Of course, caterpillars having a rich range of emotions. I imagine that caterpillar would feel terrified. It's trusting in evolution. It's trusting that it is going to emerge in the right way. And of course, businesses, when they are offered the same possibilities to go through this transformation, it's no surprise that they are terrified too. And of course, that terror is leading to inaction, which is why now traditional businesses are being overtaken by startups who have nothing to lose, who can just think in this digital first way. So yes, it's scary. And I do not blame any business who does not want to change. But inaction also means that you are missing out on incredible opportunities. Opportunities that can be quantified, potentially, by a number like this. $19 billion. I, s I pick out this number because that is the amount of money that WhatsApp was sold to Facebook for back in 2014. And when it was sold for this amount of money, their entire company looked like this. I'm not saying that WhatsApp was run by emojis. They haven't become this sophisticated yet. But at this point, their entire workforce numbered 55 people. And so if I offered you 55 people in your business, there are different ways you could put them to work. You could think, Great, 55 people can staff a new branch or a new call center. And there are definite advantages to doing that, but do the advantages really add up to $19 billion? You could apply those 55 people into, to a moonshot initiative, something that may not work, 
but potentially, if it does, it really could add $19 billion to your market cap. So as I say, not all change is born equal, and we need to start thinking in these exponential ways. So I'm going to break down three new mindsets or mindset shifts for digital-first businesses. And I'm also going to bring this to life and show you what this means through examples of different leading companies. So my name is Kate Trotter. I'm the head of trends at Insider Trends. We're a London-based futures agency. And it's an absolute pleasure to be talking to you this morning. So thank you very much. These are some of the other businesses that we help. And I do what I do because I believe that there is a better way to do things. That every year there are new innovations, new ways of thinking that essentially mean businesses don't have to struggle as much. Some businesses make it their aim to survive, but we think they can thrive and actually even very easily go on to add billions of dollars to their, to their market cap. So hopefully I can give you a couple of simple changes to unlock extra value in your business. But let's talk about this first mindset shift for digital first businesses. And this looks at what the companies sell or provide. Traditionally, businesses focus on delivering a or selling a product or a service. Today's leading digital first businesses say that they sell products and services whilst also acting like retailers and service companies and media companies as well. And so with all this complexity, they're focusing on, they're keeping it simple by focusing on one thing, which is their relationship with customers. Now, the insight for this came to me on a scouting trip in New York earlier this year. As you can possibly see from this picture, it was a cold, cloudy January day. No one was out in the shops. I'd visited a number of shops, all in the name of research, let me assure you. I was looking forward to seeing the next space on my list, which was this, the Glossier showroom. There wasn't much to say it was there. As I approached the building, I could just see this one flag. And then as I stepped into the lobby of this building, well, I knew it was on the fifth floor of this office building, so I stepped into the lobby and it immediately was incredibly underwhelmed. There was no branding in the lobby. It was just a normal office building. So I thought, okay. And I press the button to wait for the lift, the lift comes down and the doors open. So I step inside, press the button to go to the fifth floor and slowly this rickety lift starts to go up. And by the time we get to the top floor, my expectations are on the floor. This lift is really shabby. No one seems very excited to be there. I don't know. I was not expecting very much at all, but then the doors opened and I stepped out into this, a space that was packed with people, hands down the busiest I'd seen that day. And everyone had either just bought something or was clearly about to. And I thought, what's interesting about this space? Is there something different? And I couldn't see anything. It looked nice, but it didn't look any different from the other spaces I'd seen that morning. And so I went home and I did some research to find out what was going on. And I realized that Glossier actually started out as this. It started out as a blog called Into the Gloss, where they didn't make their own beauty products. They just talked about other people's beauty products. And they asked customers what they did and didn't like about the products they were using. And so in time, they built a following of a million people and they learned where the gaps in the market were. They learned that customers actually wanted a luxurious yet accessible type of beauty product, and no one was providing that. So they decided to fill this gap in the market themselves. And from the second they released their first products, their biggest challenge was actually keeping up with demand. 
But the success behind their business was not in their retail space or their branding or their marketing particularly. It was that they had this incredible following and they understood what those people wanted. They had the relationship with their customers. And we're going to see more of this from successful businesses in the coming years. We have to, because there's no other way of differentiating your business. We all know that technology is becoming more accessible, but we forget what that means. It means that any business or even any individual with a credit card can tomorrow, if we wanted to, open up a pop-up store, launch an e-commerce website without any coding knowledge for free, if we wanted to. Every individual, every business is a media company of sorts through social media and YouTube, and even manufacturing is becoming more accessible through on-demand manufacturing. And so this means that whereas businesses define themselves by what they did before, now any business can be any one of these. Leading businesses are actually all of these. And so you can't differentiate yourself by what you do anymore. Instead, the only way to differentiate is by your community, who you relate to. And the founder of Glossier puts this perfectly. She says that anything can be replicated or copied online today, but communities and relationships can't. And so that's why they're a brand's most important asset. Now, if you combine products and services and maybe retail in a new way, I think you'll find that you can relate to customers much better. This is what Peloton have found. So in a way, they're a product company. They make exercise bikes and treadmills, but they're also a media and content company because they film classes that are broadcast to these bikes. At the same time, they're also a retailer. But it's this combination between the product and the service that give them the edge. These bikes are smart and connected, so they know how often they're being used. And so Peloton gets all this data about customer usage, so they can use that to optimize and improve their service to the customer, and also future updates to the hardware too. So it's this relationship, this understanding with the customer that makes their service a lot stickier we need to remember that any of us could go and buy an exercise bike from a charity shop for about $50 if we wanted to. But Peloton customers, and there are one million of them, are choosing instead to spend 40 times as much, $2,000 on one of these exercise bikes. And each and every month, they pay $40 each to subscribe to the streamed content. But they do this because the service is much better because Peloton understand them. And so it's this slight tweak between the product and the service that has taken Peloton from zero seven months, sorry, seven years ago to a company worth between four and eight billion dollars today, depending on who you ask and depending how they come out of their IPO with. But it's not a small amount of money. Now, if you put the relationship first, you can probably find that you have a completely different point of difference to your competitors. Now, Vita Mojo have found this. They are a healthy fast food cafe with a difference. The difference being that customers can choose the precise ingredients they want to go into their lunch. Through this, Vita Mojo can better support them in achieving their health or their nutrition goals. But Vitamojo understand that going through this process every day is a little bit tedious, so they're always looking at ways to automate and improve this. So they have started to call in data from customers' wearable Fitbit devices. So if you're a customer who said that you want to lose weight and your Fitbit can see that you've sat on the couch all day, you're not going to get a very encouraging meal recommendation. Um, 
compared to if you'd run a marathon, if it can see that you've run a long way that day. But they're taking this further now. They have started working with DNA fit, so customers can take a swab of their mouths, post that off, and learn how their body reacts to food in about 27 different ways. And Vitamojo can use that to optimize how, their, how the meal works. And so you have to imagine that you're a customer who's maybe spent hours in the gym trying to lose weight or trying to build muscle. And, think, and you have to think, if you'd spent that much time investing on yourself, you would want to choose a brand like this, a brand that make it really easy to feed you the things that will support this goal, rather than just a company that has the nicest brand or is closest to your office. People choose Vitamojo because of the relationship. Because in some respects, Vitamojo literally understand the customer better than they understand themselves. So if you can get that relationship right, you can truly understand how to serve customers better than the competition. Anything you do will be a success. Now, our second mindset shift looks at where brands engage and sell to customers. Of course, the traditional way is to focus on selling through fixed spaces, stores, or maybe mobile sites or sites on laptops. But today's leading digital-first brands see the world as their playground, literally Everything can be a jumping off point to engage customers and then sell to them. And for the brands that realize they can sell anywhere, they can win big. I can give you an example of quite a traditional company, one that started out anyway in a traditional way, which is Matches Fashion. This is a, a retailer for luxury fashion. Now, they are quite a traditional business. They were founded in 1987, and now, in 2019, they have a grand total of four stores. All of these stores are in London, for some reason. But I just want you to take a minute to think, with four stores, what can you imagine their turnover could be? I've asked people this question before, and they say, OK, well, if we take the most optimistic estimate for what these stores could be selling, maybe it's 10 million per store, which would give us a total of $40 million. For matches, they are now turning over $330 million. So they're knocking this out of the park. They're able to do this because they don't just sell through four stores. They actually deliver their products to 176 different countries. So I had a look at a list and I counted these up. There are around 195 countries in the world, depending on who you ask. So if you live in Cuba or North Korea, you can't look fabulous in Gucci. But if you live almost anywhere else, you can. So overall, matches through this approach are now seeing 95% of their sales come from through digital. So I know roughly when we look at the global stats, it says that about 10% of sales go through digital. Doesn't mean your business has to adhere to that. You too could see 95% of your sales go through digital. And we can reverse this. We can also say that if matches weren't selling through digital, they'd only be making 5% of this amount. They'd only be turning over $16 million instead. So this has transformed their fortunes. When you think about engaging with customers and selling anywhere, this also means that you can sell a better quality of product for a fraction of the price of your competitors. And M. Taylor have found this. Whereas their competitors use human tailors in shops to measure customers' bodies, and those humans take hours, they use an app to provide much the same service, but in a matter of seconds. 
So the customer just needs to put, the, put this app in the corner of their room, pull a couple of poses like Superman, images are taken, and then an AI looks at that and turns it into a pattern for a shirt. A pattern for a shirt that will fit that person 20% better than a pattern made by a human tailor. And because M. Taylor doesn't need to fund stores, it doesn't need to fund a huge number of staff, they're able to provide this better shirt at half the price of their closest competitors. And also, there's, they can expand so much faster too. Their competitors can only expand at the rate at which they can fund new stores or find and train new staff, whereas the only thing restraining M. Taylor's growth is actually the rate of awareness from customers. When you start to engage and sell to customers anywhere, you'll probably find that you can sell to people in a much more memorable and elegant way than you were able to before. And Nike have found this. So these are some shots of a product drop that they did with Kendrick Lamar. Apparently, Kendrick Lamar designed this shoe. I don't know. We all know he didn't. but. Anyway, we're here to talk about the engagement process. So, Nike did sell this shoe in their stores, but they also decided to drop it live at his gigs through their sneakers app. So I imagine there was a point in the gig where Kendrick Lamar said, by the way, you can buy my shoe. Everyone got their phones out and they, they bought that. So this, at first glance, seems a little bit gimmicky. But again, as a customer, ask yourself which seems better. Would you rather go to the gig one month and then go to the shop the next and have a, quite a disconnected experience? Or would you rather be there at the gig that you've been looking forward to for months, buy the shoe in a click, have it delivered the next day, and then every time you wore the shoes after that point, all your memories of this fantastic experience would be built in to those shoes. I know which I would prefer. We also need to remember that customers are spending more now on experiences and less on products. And so it makes sense. If you want to sell more products, wrap an experience around it. So, not, it's not just selling that can happen anywhere, but engagement, entertainment, and even media can take place anywhere. So this is another example from Nike. This is their connected basketball jersey that simply has an NFC chip in it. So when the customer is wearing this, wherever they happen to be, they can tap the, the chip with their phone and instantly see the latest exclusive media content from their favorite basketball team. So media can, can be put into any object, and this increases the frequency of interactions with customers. You don't have to wait until a customer looks up your Instagram posts or visits your space. You can engage them far more regularly through this. Even though we're talking about engagement taking place anywhere, I'm not saying that physical space is completely going to die. I think physical space is relevant going forward, but physical space will just function in a, di in a different way. And M.M. Lafleur have unpicked this beautifully. They are a women's wear manufacturer and retailer. And this is, these are some shots of their offline experience. When women arrive, they're invited to check into the space. And that means that M.M. Lafleur can see everything that that customer has bought and browsed in the past, what their height and their weight is. And based on that information, they put together a curated, personalized fitting room for that customer. And this has benefits for the customer in that this is far more enjoyable. They don't have to go through aisles and aisles of items seeing if the thing they want is or isn't there. They just go straight into this space. They're given a glass of champagne and then they spend an hour talking to a lovely stylist about whatever they want to. 
And this also works really well for M.M. Lafleur because customers are happier, of course they're going to buy more. And also, because M.M. Lafleur start the relationship online, it means that these spaces can be destination spaces. They don't have to be in the most expensive parts of the city. They can be hidden away on the 30th floor of an office building. And even then, they can also be smaller because they've rethought the function of the space. Now, our third big change is in how these digital-first companies interact with customers. The traditional way is to imagine a linear relationship where the customer passively consumes whatever campaign it is or whatever product it is that you have. That is now changing to become a cyclical relationship where the customer can actively get involved in every part of your business and they can lift the lid on what's going on. A good example of this is the Intelligent X beer. This is a beer that customers drink and straight afterwards they're invited to go onto a digital, little digital questionnaire to write out what they did and didn't like about the beer. All of that feedback goes off in its thousands to an, ar an artificially intelligent algorithm that then modifies the recipe. So it's not a whole load of chefs in a test kitchen who are coming up with this beer, but an AI that's continually iterating the beer. And so based on this um, constant method of feedback and tweaking, this changes the relationship. Of course, normally you'd expect a beer company to make a beer send it to customers and just hoped they, hoped they like it. Customers would decide whether they did like it or they didn't, whether they were going to buy it again or they weren't. But with Intelligent X, this turns this linear relationship into something much more cyclical. I can imagine buying this beer month after month almost to see how it develops. This almost becomes like an alcoholic soap opera in a way, where you can find out what, what happens next. But yeah, the customer is far more actively involved than they were before. Now, there are other big changes afoot where the byproduct of this means that customers can get more actively involved in this as well. So we're seeing now one of the biggest changes in business is, of course, that they're embracing blockchain. We're seeing a variety of businesses now administer their supply chain through the blockchain. Because the old paper-based system used to take about seven days to bring back the answer to a query. But now, now all the parts of this supply chain are feeding information into the same blockchain database. That query that used to take seven days now takes just 2.2 seconds. So that's the equivalent of posting a letter to the other side of the world back in the 80s versus firing off a text message today. So that time saving equ equates into cost savings, of course, which is why systems like this are going to stay. But once business is once businesses embrace methods like this, they can also engage the customer in new ways. So Grassroots is a network of independent farmers in America who have decided also, probably for cost reasons, to embrace the blockchain. But they've realized that they can start to use their production methods as a marketing tool. Previously, things were just produced in one space and then consumed, but now they can actively get the customer involved in what's happening in their supply chain. So for the customer, they go to the supermarket, they pick up a pack of chicken, and they can scan a QR code with their phone. And very quickly, this opens up a whole series of images on a dedicated mini site so they can see where and when the chicken was born, where it was raised, maybe where it went to college, where it got married, I don't know. <laughs> Everything that happened, basically, until you selfishly decided you wanted to eat it. But this does change the relationship. Yes, suddenly something that was closed off becomes opened up and production becomes marketing. 
But of course, there are other ways to actively involve customers in production too. This, the pinnacle of this comes from Adidas. They came up with a concept that let customers personalize every aspect of their design. They scanned customers' bodies to make sure their sweater would be the perfect size and shape for them. They gave them access to large digital screens to um, tailor their design, and then they knitted it for them on site uh, through machines, not through, uh, there weren't a load of little old ladies in, in the back there knitting. Through this, there are advantages for the customer in that if they want to buy a sweater, they can definitely get the perfect sweater for them there. But for Adidas, this, again, boosts sales, but also simplifies things. They don't have to make a whole load of products and hope that customers will want them. They can just ship up a load of blank material through the supply chain that almost certainly will be made into something for a customer sooner rather than later. And this example, of course, from fashion, but almost every other category and industry is finding its version of this. So there's something from Schwarzkopf where they're putting personalized hair care into hair salons now. Bite Beauty are offering personalized lipstick that is made on the spot where customers can tailor the color, the fragrance, and the finish of their lipstick. Monocool is a Danish optician where customers can decide the perfect shape for their glasses, and those glasses are then 3D printed in titanium. And then touts, you may have seen this, this is uh, something I was excited to find in Brazil, where customers can choose any uh, any design they like from a professional graphic designer, and then any object, so whether it's a smartphone cover or a t-shirt or a poster or a mug, uh, the people in the kiosk will put that design on that product for them while they wait. But the next stage of this, it's somewhat ironic that in order to actively get customers involved, the most sophisticated version of this is to automate that active involvement. Tommy Hilfiger have been playing around with this. They've teamed up with IBM to point its artificially intelligent Watson at customers' Instagram and Twitter profiles. And based on that, it can start to see what imagery these people like and what their personality is like. And so it uses that information to come up with the first iteration of a personalized bomber jacket for that person. One of my team members was saying, so does that mean Kim Kardashian's jacket is going to be covered with images of her face? And I think the answer is yes, <laughs> by the way. But these things can be made so sophisticated. I think we're really holding ourselves back by, not, by ignoring some of the possibilities through technology. So hopefully there's some new ideas, a few new ways of thinking for you in that. I've got lots of other examples that I can show you if you want to come and chat to me afterwards. But a few final thoughts for you. Firstly, I need to ask you, how do you define yourself? Are you a caterpillar or are you a butterfly? If you're not sure, there's a number of simple questions you can ask yourself. What do you focus on selling? Where do you think you sell it? And how do you engage with customers? Are you more focused on just the product or are you really focused on the customer? Are you still fixed in where you interact with people? Or do you see that any part of the world, any billboard, even any TV show, any product can become a jumping off point to engage customers? And how do you engage people? Do you expect people just to accept or reject what you offer them? Or are you actually building dialogue with them, asking what they want and constantly responding to that? If you want to become more like a butterfly, I have a very simple exercise for you, a little piece of homework, where I'd recommend you take an hour, either by yourself or with a few trusted team members, and you also take the largest blank sheet of paper that you can find. On that sheet of paper, I'd like to invite you to design your digital-first ecosystem. 
the most important part, actually, of this is simply to forget what you already have and to design something from scratch where you focus on this dialogue with customers, you focus on engaging with them and everywhere, and you think about how you can learn from them in the ways that they use products. Once you've designed that, you can stand back and look at this ecosystem and think about what customer needs aren't being met by that. When you've worked out what isn't or aren't being met, you can um, bring back physical elements or maybe elements from your traditional model. But you may find when you bring them back, they actually look very different to the way they look today. Your overall business model might look very different too. You may move away from just defining yourself as thinking about selling this product to defining yourself as being this media company, this, this retail company, and this manufacturing company at the same time. That can seem very complicated and confusing, but that's probably a good sign. If things seem complicated, it probably means you're thinking in this digital first way. But we can look at this complexity and make things very, very simple by focusing on the one thing that separates the winners from the losers. And that, of course, is this relationship. If you focus on that relationship, you focus on building that following, and more importantly, building that understanding from customers. That means that whatever you create will respond to a need that they actually have, and it will be successful. So again, are you a caterpillar or are you a butterfly? Are you brave enough to get into this cocoon and break yourself down into DNA soup? If you can be, I assure you, it will be the tastiest, most delicious soup you have ever tasted. Thank you.